When General Andrew Jackson was being interviewed for church membership, the pastor asked him if he could forgive all of his enemies. Well, Jackson quietly thought for a moment as he recalled the stormy life of bitter fighting. And then he said, and I quote, my political enemies I can freely forgive. But as for those who have attacked me for serving my country and those who slandered my wife, pastor, he said, I cannot forgive them. Pastor then made it clear to Jackson that before he could become a member of the church, his hatred and bitterness had to be confessed and dealt with before God. After a few moments of awkward silence, the general affirmed that if God would help him, he would forgive his enemies. Now, you don't have to be a military general to struggle with forgiving those who have hurt you, those who have hurt your Loved ones, all of us grapple with that. All of us grapple with forgiving our enemies. But just like Andrew Jackson, Jackson, we can forgive those who have sinned against us. We can forgive them just like Jackson did with the help of God. And one of the ways that God helps us to forgive others is by teaching us in his word, not only that we should forgive others, but why we should forgive others. Others. Why it's so important to forgive others. And a key passage of scripture that teaches these truths about forgiveness is the passage that we began to study last week and we continue to study this week. It's Luke chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. Here's what Jesus said Do not judge, and you will not be judged. And do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you'll be pardoned. Give, and it'll be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Now, these verses, as you know, they're part of a larger section in the Gospel of Luke known as the Sermon on the Mount. A sermon in which Jesus taught his followers, his disciples, citizens of his kingdom, that they were to be different from the self righteous, hypocritical Pharisees by demonstrating true, genuine righteousness in both their attitudes as well as their outward conduct. And one of the ways that we are to do this, Jesus said, is by loving our enemies. Jesus said this in verse 27, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. In contrast to the Pharisees who hated their enemies, Jesus commands us as his disciples, to love our enemies. And who might our enemies be? Well, they could be anybody, but generally speaking, the people Jesus had in mind are those he mentioned just a few verses earlier when he spoke about those who persecute us for our faith. He said in verse 22, Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. So these are the people that we are to love, those who hate us, those who ostracize us, those who insult us, they cast insults at us, and they speak evil of us. But not only did Jesus command us to love people like this, he also told us how to love people like this, as well as why we should love people like this. And the reason he gave as to why we should love our enemies is because as children of God, we are to reflect our heavenly Father's Love And since he loves his enemies, we are then to love our enemies. That's what Jesus said in verse 35. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. And the way we are to love our enemies as God loves his enemies is very clearly spelled out for us by Jesus in the very next verse. Verse 36, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Just as God demonstrates his love by being merciful to those who are evil and ungrateful, so we are to demonstrate our love by being merciful to those who have done evil to us. That is to say, we are to show kindness and compassion to those who have sinned against us and hurt us deeply. And having said this,
as a very broad and general principle, Jesus then proceeded to get very specific by giving us four ways that we are to show compassion, mercy, kindness to our enemies. Now last week we looked at two of these ways, with the first one being this. We are to show mercy to our enemies by, number one, not judging them, which as we discovered last Sunday doesn't mean that we are forbidden to make moral judgments and form opinions about the behavior and the belief system of others. We have to do that. We're commanded to do that. Jesus did that, and he tells us to do that. But rather, what the Lord is talking about is that we are not to be hypercritical, fault-finding people who look for and actually delight and enjoy pointing out the sins of others because it makes us feel morally superior to them. He's, he's talking about that judgmental, fault-finding spirit that loves to point out everybody else's sin but never sees their own sin. That's the Pharisee in us. Jesus said, don't do that. But if after hearing what the Lord had said concerning this, instead of repenting of our self-righteous, fault-finding attitude, we completely disregard what he said. I mean completely disregard it. We don't care what he said. We have, we have no, no intention of ever obeying what he said. And Jesus says that he will judge us. He'll judge us, meaning that our deliberate and brazen disobedience to him reveals that we have never been converted, never been saved. And therefore, at the final judgment, when we stand before Christ, we will be punished along with all unbelievers if we disobey him because it shows that we've never have been converted. So the first way we show mercy to our enemy is by not judging them with that condescending, fault-finding air of superiority. The second way Jesus said that we are to show mercy to our enemies is by not condemning them. That takes it a step Further, meaning that we are not to look at an unbeliever who has deeply wounded us, deeply hurt us, and just give up on them by concluding that they're so evil, they're beyond hope. There's absolutely no hope for them ever to be saved so that they are doomed to a Christless eternity. You see, to condemn someone in your mind to hell is the opposite of being compassionate. It is to be heartless. It is to be uncaring about this person's soul. It is to never pray for their salvation They've hurt you so much, you just write them off as hopelessly lost beyond the saving grace of God. You have condemned them. Now, that's not how God treated you when you were his enemy. He didn't write you off. He didn't give up on you, though you treated him horribly. No. Instead, he mercifully cared about you enough to draw you to yourself and to save you. And now he calls you to show mercy to your enemy by having enough compassion in you to pray for them to be drawn to Christ and then to be saved. Now these folks, these are the two ways of showing mercy to an enemy that we focused on last Sunday. And today as we continue looking at how to be merciful, just like our Father is merciful, we're going to look at the next two ways that Jesus said we are to be merciful, compassionate, with the third way being this, we are to forgive our enemies. What General Jackson struggled with, we are to do. We are to forgive our enemies. The last part of verse 37 says, pardon and you will be pardoned. So moving from commands that Jesus presented in the negative form of do not, as in do not judge and do not condemn, the Lord now gives a command using positive words. He tells us what we are to do. We are to show mercy to those who hate us by pardoning them. So what does this mean? Well, the literal meaning of this Greek word that we translate pardon (coughs) is release. Release in the sense that we release this person who has sinned against us by not holding their sin against them. In other words, in spite of how much they have hurt you, in spite of how much they have deeply wounded you, in your mind, you are to just let them go. You don't seek to harm them. You don't seek vengeance. You simply forgive them by not holding their offense against them. You let them go. You let their offense go. You just release them and the offense. 
Now, forgiveness is not something that any of us find easy. I, I understand that. Every believer in Christ, even the most mature of us, have experienced the inner battles of an unforgiving heart, a heart that wrestles with anger, resentment, bitterness, holding a grudge against someone who has deeply wounded us. And sadly, though, for many Christians, they have lived so long with this unforgiving anger that they think it's normal. They think this is the way life's supposed to be. At being angry towards someone, holding a grudge against them. That's just the way life is, that they've assumed. It's, it's been such a, a long part of their lives that they think that's just the way it's supposed to be. But it's not normal. It's not the way it's supposed to be. It's not the way that Jesus wants you to live. Philip Keller, Bible teacher, in one of his books wrote this. He said, why do most of us have trouble forgiving those who have wronged us? Why is it so hard to give up old resentments and ill will? Why do we harbor hate and grudges? Why do we allow bitterness, hostility, and antagonism to cripple our character, twist our personalities, and blight our relationship with others? All of this leads to tremendous tension, stress, and darkness within. Many of us don't even realize that this state of affairs exists in our lives. In some cases, we, we have lived this, this way so long, we are scarcely aware of the warfare within ourselves. Belligerent spite and ill will have become companions with whom we almost accept as normal life partners. So, how do we get rid of these abnormal, sinful companions so that we do the merciful thing of forgiving our enemies? Listen closely. Listen closely to this. The key to forgiving those who have hurt you deeply by sinning against you, the key is to remember what a great sinner you are and how much God has forgiven you. Listen again to the Apostle Paul's words, which I read earlier. Colossians 3, verses 12 and 13. Paul says essentially the same thing in Ephesians 4. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with, un with one another and forgiving each other, Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you forgive others. Be magnanimous. That's how God has forgiven you. All of your sins. Listen, anytime you refuse to forgive someone who sins against you, you are being self-righteous and you are being proud. And you have forgotten how much you have sinned against God and how much he has forgiven you. You see, no one can ever sin against you as much as you've sinned against God. That's true of all of us. And if you know Christ as your Savior, then you certainly know that he has forgiven you, not just some of your sin, but all of your sin, even the most horrific ones. So regardless of what an enemy has done to you, no matter how badly they've treated you, you are not to withhold forgiveness from them. You are to forgive just as God has forgiven you. As one Bible teacher put it, he said, you are never more like your heavenly father than when you forgive others. He's absolutely right. And folks, that's the point that Jesus is making in commanding us to show mercy to our enemies. You are to reflect your heavenly father's merciful love by showing them mercy by no longer holding their sin against them. You're to pardon them by just releasing them from any obligation they have to repair the damage they've done. Now, you hope they'll repair it, but even if they don't, you still are responsible to forgive them. Let them go. And that, and that includes no longer holding on to the painful memories of how they've treated you. Just let it go. Now, as a believer, something that will help you in this endeavor to forgive others is that you need to remind yourself of the gospel. And in this sense, you need to preach the gospel to yourself. Because the gospel is the good news that God has forgiven all, not some, but all of your sins in Christ. You see, your sins were once like this enormous financial debt that you owed God, but due to its enormity, its massiveness, you were unable to pay. It was just too, too large. 
In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus even refers to our sins as a debt that we owed God. In teaching his disciples how to pray, the Lord told them to pray this way, and forgive us our debts. Now, the most likely reason that the word debt is used here in Matthew chapter 6 is because Matthew's gospel was written with Jewish people in mind. That was his target audience. And to a Jewish person of that day, sin was like a debt owed to God. It was a moral failure that resulted in being indebted to God unless payment for that sin was made through punishment, made through judgment. You see, to a Jewish person in Christ's day, the primary purpose, the primary responsibility in life was to obey God. By virtue of who God is, we all owe him certain things. We owe him our worship. We owe him our obedience. We owe him our service. We owe him our submission. And whenever we fail in these areas by sinning against him, we have failed to give God what we rightfully owe him. And as a result, we keep incurring debts that can only be paid by punishment. But that is where the gospel comes to our rescue. Because the gospel tells us that God in Christ has canceled our debts. And the reason that he has done this is because though we have sinned and rebelled against God by our attitudes, our actions, Christ, the second person of the triune Godhead, by his mercy, by his grace, he paid all of our debts by being punished in our place on the cross. See, although the Bible teaches that God's nature is to love it also teaches that he is perfectly holy, righteous, just, and his justice demands, absolutely demands payment for sins committed. Therefore, God cannot, will not arbitrarily forgive and cancel our sin debts unless those sin debts are paid for, unless there has been an acceptable punishment for those sin debts. And the good news of the gospel message is that when Christ died, he paid. He paid all the moral debt owed by everyone who would ever trust him for salvation. And this is why the Bible very clearly, very emphatically declares that the moment that we place our trust in Christ for our salvation, God, as the perfect judge, completely forgives us, which means that he cancels all of our debts. We are judicially, we are legally forgiven of all of our sins. He has released us from our massive debt that we could never repay, even for all of eternity. We could never repay that debt. And that's only because God's justice was completely satisfied in the death of his son. And therefore he can and he does forgive us without violating his perfect standard of justice. And that's why the Bible says that God will never hold a moral debt against you because they've all been paid for by Christ. And God is totally, totally, totally satisfied with that payment. Therefore, by his grace, you are the recipient, if you know Christ, of his complete forgiveness. And this is the reason why we read such marvelous verses in the New Testament, such as Ephesians 1, 7. Listen to this. In him... We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. According to the riches of his grace. How rich is his grace? Well, you'll never figure that one out. It's so rich and deep. But he's forgiven us all of our trespasses according to those riches. 1 John 2.12 I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. Not your sin, but your sins, all of them. Again, back to Colossians, but now Colossians 2, 13 and 14. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, all of them. Paul goes on to explain how. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, that's the law, all the laws we've broken, in which which was hostile towards us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. All of our debt was placed on the cross with Jesus, and he paid for it. Listen, I'm going to repeat what I said earlier. The key to forgiving others, 
is to remember how much you have been forgiven by God. So anytime you struggle to forgive others, you need to recall just how sinful you have been and how sinful you continue to be. And therefore, how much God has forgiven you. Otherwise, if you don't do this, you're going to have a serious problem with self-righteousness. So that you will deceive yourself into thinking that you are just not capable of doing what an enemy has done to you. You're above all of that. Listen, that's nonsense. That's nonsense. It's not true. We are all capable of doing whatever an enemy has done to us and even worse. Listen, how dare you not forgive those who have sinned against you. It is the height of arrogance. It is this hypocritical self-righteousness to accept God's forgiveness for this massive amount of sin debts that you have uh, incurred, but refuse to forgive those who have sinned against you, who by comparison, they've sinned just a little bit. As John Stott writes, once our eyes have been opened to see the enormity of our offense against God, the injuries which others have done to us appear by comparison extremely trifling. He's absolutely right. They are trifling by comparison. But let's face it. Reality is there are scores of professing Christians who are not willing to forgive anybody. Instead of releasing those who have sinned against them, they harbor old hurts. They nurture those feelings until they are absolutely dominated by bitterness. They carry resentment. They hold grudges in their hearts over things said or done to them years ago. It's as if it happened yesterday. It's so fresh on their minds. They actually nourish. They actually cherish animosities. And they have no desire, no interest, and no intention of pardoning anyone who has wronged them. Ever. They're just not going to do it. It doesn't matter that Jesus said to do it. They're not doing it. So what do we say to those who claim to know Christ but have this absolute unwavering unwillingness to forgive others. Well, we say to them exactly what Jesus said in Luke 6, 37, pardon and you will be pardoned. That is to say, the person who forgives others is the one who will be forgiven by God. This is not to say that the way to be forgiven by God is by forgiving others. That would be salvation by work, salvation by something we do. And we know from scripture that salvation is totally by grace. It has nothing to do with us. It's based not on, we've done, not on what we've done. It's based on what Christ has done alone. No, what Jesus is saying is that those who forgive others are those who evidence, who demonstrate, who reveal, who prove that they have already been forgiven by God. And therefore, they will continue to be forgiven by God. However, the opposite is true as well. Those who are adamant, resolute about not forgiving others will not be forgiven by God. They have never been forgiven by him and they will not be forgiven by him. You see, forgiving others, it's just one of the marks of someone who has been forgiven by God. Meaning it demonstrates that they've been converted to Christ. It reveals that they are a true Christian. Therefore, those who are just unbending in their refusal to forgive others, who have absolutely no desire for God to even help them to forgive others. Am I on here? Now I'm back. They couldn't possibly have experienced divine forgiveness in Christ. Couldn't possibly. And therefore, their lives are still characterized by this animosity and hatred that all unsaved people have. That's what, that's what Paul wrote in Titus chapter 3, verse 3, when he said, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. That's how we were before we were converted. If you're still like that now, you've never been converted. And that's why you won't forgive somebody, because they've, you've never experienced God's forgiveness. You're still hateful, and only hateful. Concerning how, a, how Christians, true Christians, eventually work through their struggles with forgiving. That's the difference. We struggle, but we work through it. We end up forgiving others. One Bible teacher said these, these words. I thought they were very good. He said, true Christians can and do forgive. 
This is not to say that they do not struggle with forgiving or that they are free from battles with bitterness or hatred or that they are never so hurt and in such emotional shock that they are unable to respond with forgiveness. But it is to say that they work at forgiving and ultimately they do forgive. That's the mark of a believer. Not that you struggle with forgiveness. We all do. But that you, in your struggle, you work through that and you eventually come out the other side and you do forgive. Now, I'm going to give you an important truth about forgiveness that I think is going to help you to extend mercy to others. In forgiving others, it is critical, folks, to understand that forgiveness does not require that you forget about the offense, about the sin committed against you. And I say this because it is very common to hear Christians say something like this, well, I can forgive, but I certainly cannot forget. Listen, God doesn't expect you to forget what somebody has done to to hurt you, as if you can just turn off that part of your brain and pretend that it never happened. The Bible never says forget that that you've been hurt. How how are you going to do that? Something did happen. You were deeply hurt by the actions or the non-actions of someone. So you can't just forget that this happened. You don't have to dwell on it, but you can't just forget it and pretend it didn't happen. See, forgiveness means that while you still may be very aware of the hurt someone has inflicted upon you, you no longer hold this action against that person. Here's the key. It means by an act of your will, not your feelings, because if you waited until you felt like forgiving somebody, you would never forgive them. By an act of your will, you choose to forgive them. Your feelings eventually will catch up to your choice. You choose to forgive them, You choose to no longer keep punishing them in your mind or by your behavior towards them. You see, this is precisely the way that God has forgiven us. I read to you Isaiah 43, verse 25. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. When God says that he doesn't remember our sins, it doesn't mean that that he can't remember them as if he suddenly has amnesia. Of course not. He simply means that he chooses to no longer remember them in the sense that he doesn't hold them against us anymore. Of course God knows all about your sins, all about my sins. He doesn't forget them, but he will no longer recall them in order to punish us. The debt's been canceled. Folks, that's how we are to forgive those who sin against us. Stop punishing them in your minds or in your behavior. Remember how much you have been forgiven. And then, regardless of how you feel, choose to no longer hold anyone's sins against them. Just release them. And when you do that, what are you doing? You're showing mercy to an enemy because instead of seeking to get back at them, You have chosen to forgive them, and that's exactly the way that God has shown his mercy to you. Now, so far, Jesus has told us three ways to show mercy to an enemy. We are not to judge them, we are not to condemn them, and we are to forgive them. But before closing this section, the Lord gives us one final way to show compassion to someone who hates you, and that is by being generous to them. Verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. They'll pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. (laughs) Now, surprisingly, the Lord moves from using our attitudes to show mercy to an enemy to using material goods to show them mercy. He says that we are to show mercy to an enemy by giving them something. What he means by this is that out of compassion, we are to give something of material value to an enemy, either goods or money, so that we'll be able to bring some relief to whatever need they have. But there's more here than just giving something to an enemy. I want you to notice what Jesus went on to say would happen when we do show mercy this way by our giving. He said, and it will be given to you. Meaning that whatever you give an enemy, God will repay you. 
But that's not all. There's more. Look at the rest of what Jesus said about giving to an enemy and being repaid by God. He said, they will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and then running over. For by your standard of measure, it'll be measured to you in return. So we read that and we say, what in the world is that talking about? Well, what we have here is Jesus describing what took place when a person in his day, in his culture, went to the marketplace to purchase some grain. You see, when an individual went to the the market to buy grain, he would bring a jar or a container to store the grain. The merchant would pour the grain into the container until it was full. Then he would press the grain down with his strong hands to make more room in the container. After this, he would give the container a good shake in order for the grain to settle into every available space in that container. Then the merchant would fill the container again all the way to the top until there was just no more room so that the grain now overflowed into the lap of the buyer's long robe so that the robe functioned like a pocket. He would just hold it out, and it would be flowing into his robe. Now, that's the imagery that Jesus is picturing for us. And what he means by this market day illustration of overflowing grain is that in showing mercy to an enemy, you are not simply to give them something to meet their need, but you are, watch this, you are to be generous in giving them something to meet their need, not the minimal, but generosity. And if you are generous in your giving, then Jesus said God will be generous in giving to you. Now, generosity isn't something a lot of Christians are familiar with because in their desire to be careful with their money, frugal with their money, good stewards with their money, sometimes we can cross the line and end up being just downright cheap and stingy, calling it good stewardship, but it's really cheapness. But that's not right. It's not right because God commands us. This is not an option. This is not a suggestion. He commands us to be generous, especially to an enemy, someone who doesn't deserve our our merciful generosity. And why is it so important to be generous, not only to an enemy, but to others as well? It's important because generosity is a character quality that belongs to God. It's important for a Christian to be generous because God is generous. So to be generous is to be like God. It's godly. It's righteous. It's Christ-like. See, generosity is one of God's attributes. Consider what the Bible says about God's generosity. Just a few verses. In 2 Corinthians 8 9, the Apostle Paul tells us how generous Jesus Christ is. Your Savior is remarkably generous. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. The Lord gave up all of his riches for a time. You see, before the incarnation, Jesus was rich in glory, in the sense that he possessed and had usage of everything, and I mean everything in the universe, as well as the full use of all of his divine attributes. But when he became a man, which is what Christmas is all about, he gave up those riches, and he became poor so that we who are spiritually poor could become spiritually rich. This is how generous Christ is. He has given you all spiritual riches because he, by nature, is gracious and generous. But it isn't only in the area of spiritual riches that God is generous. He's generous in bestowing on us physical blessings as well. Here's what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? So Paul asks here some questions. And of course, the answer to these questions is that everything we have has been given to us by God. There's nothing that you and I have that has not come through the gracious hand of God. Therefore, we should not boast about anything we have because everything we have, we have received 
from God. The very air we breathe to continue living and working, that comes from God. There's nothing you possess that did not come from him. This is why James wrote in chapter 1, verse 17 of his letter, every good thing and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Folks, everything you have is because God, by his nature, is just generous. Therefore, those who are his sons, His daughters, through faith in Christ, are to reflect their heavenly Father's generosity by being merciful in giving liberally to their enemies, just as God has been mercifully liberal in giving to you when you were his enemy. Now, if you struggle with being generous, especially with people you don't like and people who don't like you, it it is very understandable. It's not acceptable, but it's understandable. And that's because by nature, no one is born generous and thoughtful of others, especially complete strangers. We are, we are all born Scrooges. It takes God's work of grace in our lives to transform us from self-absorbed individuals who think only about consuming money on ourselves to become generous people who want to share our money with others, especially our enemies. But the more you grow in Christ, the the more you mature in him, the more generous you should become because generosity is part of of Christ's character. Therefore, Christ's likeness, what does it look like? Well, part of what it looks like is it evidences itself by being generous, thoughtful, kind, merciful to others by sharing our resources. Listen, learning to be generous has been a challenging lesson for me. Many years ago, when I was one of the speakers at a Bible conference out west, some of my friends and I went out to eat one night after the evening session of the conference, and we went to this bakery-type restaurant where you just step up to the counter and you give your your order. Now, when we entered the restaurant, I saw what appeared to be a homeless man sitting to the side drinking a cup of coffee. It was a very cold night. This did not, as I said, it took place out west, not in Florida, and it was it was chilly. But to my shame, I have to say I paid no attention to this man other than I just saw him. And I didn't pay any attention because I was very hungry, and all I was thinking about was satisfying my stomach. Well, after we ate dinner and we were walking back to the car, I discovered that one of my friends had gone over to this homeless man, taken him to the counter, and said, you order whatever you want, and I mean whatever you want. But upon hearing this, I felt this deep sense of conviction from the Holy Spirit upon me. I was convicted of my selfishness, my lack of thoughtfulness for this homeless man, and above all, my my lack of being generous. And as I walked along the sidewalk that, that night, staying a little back of the others, I not only asked the Lord to forgive me for my sin, but also from this point on to make me generous like my friend. Now, as I said that happened many years ago, but from that moment on, generosity, the pursuit of generosity, has been a passionate pursuit of mine to the point where I have to constantly remind myself and yes, even force myself to be generous with others, friends and family members, waiters and waitresses, the church, and yes, even some people who I know don't like me and uh, they would consider themselves hostile to my faith in Christ. Now, I'm only telling you this to encourage you to be generous yourself and to give liberally to others, especially those who you would consider to be your enemy because this is how God said you are to show them mercy. And this is part of the sanctifying process of growing in Christ. It's all part of that. And if you do this, if you're generous with others, then what can you expect God to do in your life? For most of us, money is tight. We're talking about giving to others. Well, what, what is going to be our situation? Well, using the picture that Jesus said happens in the marketplace, you can expect God to pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. In other words, 
If you are generous with others, God, using whatever means and whatever people he chooses to use, will be generous with you. The opposite, though, is true also. If you are not generous with others, but instead you're stingy, you're tight-fisted, then don't expect God to bless you materially because he'll be tight-fisted with you just as you've been with others. Folks, this is what Jesus meant by the last sentence, last few words of verse 38. For by your standard of measure, it'll be measured to you in return. In other words, how you treat others when it comes to being generous or not being generous, that's exactly how God's going to treat you. Whatever the measure of your generosity or lack thereof, that's the measure with which you can expect God to treat you. You decide. Listen, the clear and consistent teaching of Scripture is that if you are generous with your money and your possessions, then God will be generous with you. And if you are ungenerous with your money and your possessions, then he will withhold his generosity from you. See, not only did Jesus teach this, so this, this is not isolated, like you'll never find this anywhere else in the Bible, so maybe we're not interpreting it correctly. No, this is taught throughout the Word of God. Paul, for example, taught the same thing. Paul said this to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 9, 6. He said, now, this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. He's not simply talking about farming here. He's talking about giving others, about being generous, about giving your possessions, your money. King Solomon said the same thing in Proverbs 11, 24 through 26. He said, there's one who scatters and yet increases all the more. And there's one who withholds what's justly due and yet it results only in want. The generous man will be prosperous and he who waters will himself be watered. He who withholds grain, the people will curse him, but blessing will be on the head of him who sells it. Again, Proverbs 19, verse 17. One who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his good deed. Now, I realize that someone may object at this point about all this talk about God blessing us with material things if, if we're generous, because this sounds very much like the message that those who proclaim the prosperity gospel have to say. They say something like... Off, am I, I'm back. <laughs> Give, they say something like this. Give a lot of money to my ministry so that God will bless you with great wealth. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Not at all. Because modern day prosperity preachers appeal to people to give a lot of money as a shrewd investment so that they can become wealthy. Both the people who give and the preacher who gets. Personal wealth is their ultimate goal. And it's a goal motivated by nothing but greed and covetousness. That's not what Jesus is teaching in Luke chapter 6. Not at all. So what the Lord is teaching here has nothing to do with getting money back so that you can become wealthy and just consume it upon yourself, but rather that you are to give generously to your enemy as a way of showing them mercy. And if you do that, then God will give you more money so that, watch this, you can continue to show mercy to others by being even more generous with them. In other words, what drives us to be generous isn't greediness, but rather the desire to obey Jesus by being merciful to others so that when he is generous with us, we can show more mercy by continuing to be generous. This isn't the way to make money that we keep and hold on to and consume ourselves. This is the way to make money so that we can give it away. That's what honors the Lord. Now, folks, for the last few weeks, you've heard the same basic message and truth from the scriptures, from this pulpit, that you are commanded, not suggested, but commanded by your Lord, Jesus Christ, to love and show mercy to those who don't love you. Those who have never shown you love, never shown you mercy, and most likely they never will. This is how we reflect. This is how we demonstrate God's love to our enemies. And this is how we show the world that we have been transformed by Jesus Christ. Years ago, a friend said to me, he said, Steve, when I was converted, 
my checkbook was converted to. I've never forgotten that. Well put. It's true. So show the world that you've been converted in all these ways by doing what Jesus told you to do. Show mercy to your enemies by not being a fault finder, by not condemning others, by, by forgiving those who have sinned against you, and as we've focused on today, by being generous with others. And if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Lord, then know that God, God has been incredibly merciful to you. You say, well, how, how so? Well, he's allowed you to live. He's allowed you to live up to this point so that, so that he's not taken you in death, which means you still have the opportunity to turn to Christ for salvation. Every breath you take is a gift from God. Tomorrow may be too late. Tomorrow you could die. This afternoon you could die. While you have the time, while you have the opportunity, because God has been merciful to you, turn to Christ today if you don't know him. The Bible says today is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Today, not tomorrow. Tomorrow's not promised to you. You have now. Turn to Christ. If you would like to speak to one of our pastors about this, we'll be up here. Some of us will be up here at the front. Just come and see me and someone will talk to you. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for letting us Letting us understand your words in this series, Lord. Help us to be obedient, even as we move on in weeks to come to other passages. Help us to remember what you've taught us these last few weeks. Lord, we said at the beginning, this is radical teaching, but it's so true. Lord, we are different than Pharisees. We are different than the scribes. We want to be like you. Oh, that we may be like Christ, Lord. Generous forgiving, those who are gracious, those who don't condemn, those who don't enjoy finding fault with others. Lord, help us to be like that. You've been like that with us, and we thank you. We pray for those who may not know you, Lord. Draw them to yourself. Draw them to yourself that they might be saved. And Lord, with all of our struggles and battles, help us to work our way through these truths. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for the enormous debt that you canceled. We will forever be praising you for that. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.